is Suzanne Gervais and I have been invited by the wonderful Westwards to share with you my new, new novel. Westwards is an amazing organisation that seeks to give voice to all of us through story. As a writer, I put a lot of myself into my work. I can't see the point of writing and telling a lie. That doesn't mean that I write non-fiction. No, I write fiction. But it's always underpinned by truth and the great issues of life. I'm going to be talking today about a new novel that has been released. There it is, Shadows of Olive Trees. It's about young women at the cusp of adulthood. It's 18 years old, going into their 20s and how they find out who they are. In the 70s, it was a time of enormous change where we had very conservative values and our parents and families who were important to us, who we loved. They wanted young women to follow the traditions of the past, be married, have children, not seek education. Now that's fine if that's what you choose, but if you do not, it becomes a point of conflict. And this story is about that enormous change between women moving from the past values to values of freedom. And it's tough, especially since you love your parents, you love your culture, but you do have the right to be all you can be. This story is about women's education, the first test tube baby, the first woman's refuge. It's about all those issues that we need to develop as full human beings, but it is not against men. I have a father who I adored, a son who I love despite his big mouth. It's very noisy. A brother who I also love. It's about us together, men and women, creating an equal world which enhances all of us. I'm a firm supporter of Emma Watson, the ambassador for equality with the United Nations and her hashtag he for she campaign where men and women together ensure we all have equal opportunity. So I'm going to read from the beginning. There's two girls walking home from school, year 12, Tessa and Athena. At the end of the day, Tessa and Athena walk to the bus stop together. They talk about school and family and the rough sandstone brick terraces they pass with their decaying occupants. There's unconscious irony at a girl their age standing against power to women, slashed against the wall of the Church of Christ. Her thin legs are smoothed by clear stockings that disappear into a shiny leather skirt. The girls catch her eye and she calls out laughingly to them. Want to join me? You can make a lot of money. Her hand rubs the air. Tessa looks down as they walk past. She whispers, her stockings aren't like ours. The girl is occupied now, talking a mat to a man who towers over her. Tessa shudders. Is she 18 like us? Athena shakes her head. I don't know. They walk quickly then, their reflections a precious secret between them. The bus ship's trip is short and Tessa watches Athena move away towards her home. They are joined in their Greek ancestry. But Athena is third generation Australian and only speaks Greek to her grandparents. Her parents go on short holidays and leave Athena and her brother to look after the house. Tessa can't imagine her father ever allowing that. 
Athena has parties and goes to other girls' homes and school camps. Tessa is forbidden. Sometimes she argues with her mother, please tell me why everyone is going, tell me. Her mother never answers properly, hiding behind tables and chairs until Tessa shouts, it's not fair. Then her mother cries and Tessa whispers, I'm sorry. Tessa dares not ask her father. He remembers the village he came from and still looks to the traditions and old ways. Tessa is allowed her special friend because Athena's parents go to the large white Greek Orthodox church. The church stands firmly planted between the red brick Australian cottages. It would have looked magnificent against the green twisted olive trees on an ancient hillside. But its round basilica and looming towers sit alien among its neighbours. Sundays are precious to Tessa. She has faith, even when the service is endless. Tessa looks at Athena, who sits beside her. Athena nudges her when the priest's hat is crooked or if someone chants out of tune and they laugh secretly behind their hands. Sometimes Athena shakes her dark hair and lets her fingers slide slowly through the long strands. Tessa noticed men look until their wives or mothers nudge them back to their prayers. Tessa touches her hair nervously in anticipation, but no one looks. This Sunday is special because Tessa's parents have given her permission to go on a picnic with Athena's family. The service ends and people gather outside for the social talk that is a necessary ritual, inquiring about each other's health and family, talking politics and taxes and church. Athena puts her arm through Tessa's as they wait for people to complete their observances. Tessa is relieved to wave goodbye to her parents and her younger brother, Peter, who is 16. Tessa is relieved that she's not going home to prepare their usual Sunday lunch. She doesn't want to help her mother cook and serve and clear up today. She doesn't want to watch Peter sit with her father at the table expectantly. I'm happy. I'm going on a picnic with Athena. Athena's voice is musical as she calls her into the car. They hum to the songs on the radio and Athena rocks against her until they are in rhythm. The greenness of the park makes a wedge in the suburban sprawl of bricks and mortar. They drive into the park and stop midway between rose gardens and lakes. Athena's parents spread out a blanket on the grass. There is so much food and they indolently eat roast lamb and buttered rolls. It's the hottest part of the day and Athena's parents lie on their picnic lounge chairs, half dozing. We're going for a walk. Is that all right? Athena asks. Go on, enjoy the park, but don't go too far. Her mother answers. The sunlight drifts through the trees, making the girls appear dreamlike. Athena's hair glistens in the reflection of the hot rays. They wander, wander past gardens through trees, following unknown trails far from the blanket and picnic lounge chairs. The girls lean against each other. Tessa puts her arm around Athena's waist. Athena softly murmurs Tessa's name. And so it goes on. Look, I hope you do have a chance to read Shadows of Olive Trees. I promise you, it will be a journey into literature, into the rise of feminism, and empower us all to seek equality. On that note, thank you, Wes, for words for inviting me to speak, and thank you for listening. Have a good day.